The Keynesian liquidity preference framework will give us a money demand function, which will also explain the fluctuations in velocity. According to the Keynesian perspective, there are three main reasons for holding money, the transactions motive, precautionary motive, and the speculative motive. Transactions motive is simply saying that the demand for money balances is proportional to the nominal value of transactions or your nominal income. Higher the nominal income, higher will be the demand for money balances. Secondly, people always want to hold some money against some unexpected wants. And this precautionary motive is again proportional to their nominal income. So higher the nominal income, higher will be the demand for money balances. Lastly is your speculative motive in which money is a part of your portfolio of wealth. And when I hold money, I'm basically taking away funds from some alternative asset, which is giving me some return. So interest rate is the opportunity cost of holding money. Before higher the interest rate, lower will be the demand for nominal money balances. The Keynesian perspective also distinguishes between your real money balances and your nominal money balances. Bringing the three motives together, I can write my demand curve for real money balances as a function of nominal interest rates and real GDP, where L is also representing your liquidity because we always hold money because it's the most liquid asset. That's where the name of the model is also coming from, the liquidity preference framework. So demand for liquidity depends upon your real GDP and nominal interest rate. Higher the real GDP, higher will be the demand for liquidity or for real money balances. Higher the nominal interest rate, lower will be the demand for liquidity or demand for real money balances will decrease. Rewriting my equation of exchange, I can solve for velocity. I can take this P and take it in the denominator. This is a simple math manipulation. And now I can substitute my demand for real money balances with my Keynesian function. As you can see, velocity is now no longer constant. If my money demand function depends upon interest rates, so will velocity. So for example, if interest rates are going up, it will cause my real demand for money balances to go down. And as the demand for real money balances decreases, it will cause the velocity to increase. So in fact, velocity and interest rate move in the same direction, which is also consistent with the data that we just saw earlier. In the 1970s, we had high interest rates reaching as high as 20%. We saw velocity also being very high. And when your nominal interest rates are going down, velocity also starts to decrease. So any shock to the economy that causes your interest rates to change, that causes your money demand to change, will also in turn change our velocity. Velocity is now no longer constant. But the problem is that if velocity is not constant, we can now no longer have a direct linkage between nominal GDP and money growth rate. So what we saw in our quantity theory of money, that money growth rate will determine changes in your price level and changes in your real GDP. This connection no longer holds. We can now no longer use money growth rate as a tool to effectively control inflation, at least not in the short run. So we saw two different types of money demand functions. In one, we saw interest rate does not affect the money demand at all. That was our money demand from the quantity theory of money and velocity was assumed to be constant. And alternatively, we saw our uh, money demand function, which is very sensitive to interest rate fluctuations and therefore velocity is no longer constant, but that is collapsing the linkage between money growth and inflation. Now, which one is the correct way? If interest rates do not affect Affect your money demand so you observe a money demand function which is relatively stable then that means velocity is also more likely to be very stable in this economy and in that case quantity theory of money will hold and we can use money growth rate in order to affect our aggregate spending and also to affect our inflation rate however if you see a money demand function which is highly unstable very sensitive to interest rate fluctuations now velocity is no longer constant it cannot be predicted and therefore we can no longer use the money growth rate as a way to control our inflation or our nominal GDP in the short run. So stability of the money demand function is a key ingredient. Depending upon whether we are working with a stable or an unstable money demand function will help us determine what policy instrument does your central bank use. If the money demand curve is very stable and the central bank can accurately control its money supply, then there's no difference. We can use either of these two. However, in actual fact, money demand curve is highly unstable and it's very difficult to control larger monetary aggregates like M2, M2 plus because of financial innovation. For now, let's assume if they can control our monetary aggregate. In this case, with the unstable money demand function, as the money demand fluctuates, 
holding your monetary aggregate constant will cause huge fluctuation in our nominal interest rates. The third scenario brings us to interest rate targets. Here I still have a very unstable money demand curve, so it can be fluctuating, increasing or decreasing. But now our central bank will let go of our monetary aggregate. Letting go of the targets of monetary aggregates has been the go-to route for most central banks around the world because it is becoming increasingly difficult to control our monetary aggregate, especially in the face of financial innovation. You can maybe control our monetary base very accurately, which remember is currency and reserves. However, larger monetary aggregates like M1, M2, and even larger ones become increasingly difficult to control. So in the face of this environment where you can no longer control the monetary aggregate accurately and money demand function is highly unstable, it's best to have an interest rate target instead. Now, as you can see with the interest rate target, even if money demand increases, my interest rates remain stable. And as a central bank, I will now accommodate this increase in money demand by increasing my supply of money. Likewise, if the money demand decreases, in order to maintain my interest rate target, I will reduce my quantity of money. With interest rate targeting, you can see therefore that our money supply has essentially become demand determined. Whatever is happening to money demand in the economy, central bank will adjust our money supply in order to ensure that interest rate remains at its desired target level. With our unstable money demand function and high financial innovation, which reduces the central bank's ability to control our monetary aggregates very accurately, it has been increasingly seen that most central banks are now moving towards interest rate targets. Interest rate targets will now reveal information about the stance of monetary policy for the central bank of that country. A lot of central banks have moved to interest rate targets also because they have a much better effect on the real economy. While inflation is tied to money growth in the long run, Interest rates are the tool policymakers use to stabilize inflation in the short run. And we'll explore this concept in more detail when we look at the reserve market in which banks are borrowing and lending from each other. And the central bank has a choice whether to choose the policy instrument as one of the reserve aggregates or have one of the short term interest rates as its monetary policy instrument. In this example, I have the demand for real money balances, which you can see as a Keynesian function. Demand for real money balances not only depends upon our real GDP, but is also inversely related to our nominal interest rates. So in this question, we first have to find an expression for velocity and then calculate velocity given the real interest rate is 4% and my expectation of inflation is 1%. So first finding for velocity, I know velocity is nominal GDP over M and I can again take this P in the denominator and it gives me Y over M over P, which is my demand for real money balances. Demand for real money balances is already given to us. So substituting that over here, Y and Y cancel each other out. I squared is my denominator of the denominator, which is essentially the numerator so I can bring it up on the top taking the inverse of 0 0.001 it gives me 10,000 I squared and you can see this expression is telling us that velocity directly depends upon interest rate fluctuations higher the interest rate higher will be the velocity lower the interest rate lower will be our velocity now let's calculate velocity for this given information note over here that the real interest rate is four percent and my expectation of inflation is one percent this information is asking you to use your understanding of the fisher equation which tells you nominal are simply real plus expectation of inflation in this case my nominal interest rate is therefore five percent and remember we are going to substitute always in terms of decimal points so five percent is 0 0.05 using my velocity function I get my velocity of money supply as 25 which is quite close to what we actually get for velocity of m1 velocity of m1 usually ranges anywhere between 10 to 20. in the second question you're asked what will happen to your nominal gdp if money supply grows by 20 percent but velocity is declining by 30 percent so recall our dynamic form of the equation of exchange these are all percentage changes for nominal gdp i can write this as percentage change in times y and this tells me that my nominal GDP will actually decline by 10% and this is a very interesting outcome and you can apply it to the real world situation imagine a situation in which your central bank is injecting huge amounts of money into this financial system by conducting large quantitative easing programs so they are increasing the monetary base causing the money supply to increase and it's in fact increasing by 20%. However, if people are not spending that money or if financial institutions are not spending that money that is being injected into the financial system, 
then velocity is actually declining and in this case it is declining by 30 percent so when people fear the future being apprehensive about the future they don't want to spend too much they are holding on to all of that additional cash that they have they are not using that cash for additional transactions number of transactions on average have drastically gone down and all of this new money being pumped in the economy has no effect and but in fact the declining velocity offsets the effect of this increased money supply and our nominal GDP actually decreases by 10%. We saw this in the aftermath of the financial crisis. The US Federal Reserve injected huge amounts of money into the financial system. However, the nominal GDP was still declined. And if we look at data for that time period, it also shows us that velocity was actually declined. So velocity, remember, depends upon people's behavior. And people's behavior cannot always be predicted. So if people are holding on to their money and not using it for transactions, velocity is declining, and we are not having our desired effect on the economy through this monetary expansion. So this was a very simple example of when your money demand is unstable, velocity is not constant, quantity theory of money is completely ineffective. It does not help us control nominal GDP or the inflation in this economy.